from your favorite source for Chicago White Sox talk, delivering news, interviews, analysis, and more. This is the Sox Machine Podcast with your hosts, Jim Margulis and Josh Nelson. Thanks, Rob, and welcome to a special edition of the Sox Machine Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Nelson, and in just a few days, the 2023 Major League Baseball Draft will begin on Sunday, July 9th. It kicks off the Major League Baseball All-Star festivities as the Home Run Derby's on Monday, July 10th, and of course the All-Star Games on Tuesday, July 11th, all in Seattle. I've been covering this draft class for a while with the 2023 Major League Baseball draft reports on SoxMachine.com, providing my thoughts during the college season of the top prospects of this class while trying to guess who could be available for the White Sox at pick 15. I need help, though, with finalizing my final watch board of prospects to focus on for the White Sox. And lucky for us, one of the best friends of the podcast is here to help. Joining us is senior writer of MLB.com. It's Jim Callis. And Jim, thanks for joining the show again. Thanks, Josh. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I'm very impressed that you're, you're, you're doing this you know, with your impending wedding the same week as draft week. And <laughs> as we pissed off air. Uh, who knew we'd have a NASCAR race in downtown Chicago um, while you're trying to do all this stuff too. But I want to ask you a question first. I always okay. enjoy our podcasts and we have great discussions, but I want to ask you first, like realistically speaking, who do you want at 15? Like who's, who do you want that has a realistic chance of getting to number 15? You know, that's a great question. Cause I know I, it, I think Hurston Waldrip could be available from Florida and I like his arsenal. And man, the White Sox really need help on the starting pitching front. But I think pie in the sky, I don't think he's going to drop to the White Sox. But Kyle Teal also addresses a huge need for the White Sox. The White Sox have huge needs all of a sudden uh, at, at catcher. And yeah. while the White Sox need catching help after Kyle Teal, uh, you got some prep catchers, but that's always a risky demographic, and they don't always stay behind the plate. And after Teal, there's just not a a dependable college starting catcher that you would take, I think, before the third round. So if Kyle Teal dropped to the White Sox at pick 15, I think pie in the sky, that would be the way I'd go. That, that's what I would hope for the White Sox. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ruin your day or at least your podcast by telling you I don't think there's any chance Kyle Teal can get to the White Sox. Like, I had him go on 11th, and I don't even really believe. Like, it's weird when you do mock drafts, you have to put one name with each team. Like I mentioned, I try to give you this is who I think they're looking at. Mm -hmm. And it's not like I'm trying to say, oh, I listed 15 guys and I got the guy right. I just, I'm letting you know who's in there. But you ultimately have to put one guy with each team. And I don't really feel, I feel like Kyle Teal, I had him going 11th to Angels. I feel like he's going to go higher. Like, his absolute floor is the Cubs at 13. But I really feel like he's going in the top 10. And I do think Waldrop probably will be there. I don't think the White Sox are going to take Waldrop if he's there. So, I, yeah, I don't think you're getting either one of those guys. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's it's fine. I've I've come to realize over the years that the guys that they want the White Sox to take, uh, they do not take. So that's fine. Uh, <laughs> you've been covering the draft for a while. I'm not saying you're old, Jim. I'm just saying you've been old. covering the draft for a while. Since 1989. So I am but in your career covering the draft, where does this draft class rank in overall quality? Because there's a lot of hype with this particular draft class because you have a lot of people, including me, but I've been doing this just for a little bit, that this is one of the best classes they've seen in overall talent in a while. Yeah, I think that's fair. Like, it seems like once a decade, you get a draft and you're like, that's the best draft of the decade. And you almost know immediately. Like 2011, we knew... Going into it was going to be a great draft, and it was. Um, I don't think 2023 is quite as good as 2011, but it's a, it's, a, it's a really good draft for a couple reasons. One, there's five guys who would be pretty strong candidates to go number one overall in a typical draft. You, know, you got the two LSU guys, outfielder Dylan Cruz and right-hander Paul Skeens, and you got the three other outfielders, Florida's White Langford and then high schoolers um, Max Clark, and uh, Walker Jenkins. So you have that. That's one. Two, because the 2020 draft was only five rounds, obviously fewer players were taken. There was fewer. There was less money in the bonus pool, so there were fewer picks and, and fewer dollars to shift around. And so you have high school players who – and there would have been more high school players signed 
in a normal draft, which 2020 was not, who are now juniors. Like Dylan Cruz pulled out of the draft because he wasn't going to go quite as high as he thought he was. In a normal year, maybe somebody, I don't know his asking price was, but maybe he wanted $3 million. Maybe somebody would have been able to get him $3 million. Kyle Teal, he pulled out of the draft pretty early too. And I'm not saying, like, I think Virginia's guys often are really strongly committed. So maybe he would have pulled out anyway. But that's just two examples of, of guys we've already talked about who in a normal year might have signed. So I think it's stronger for that. I, I do think the position player crops on both sides are really strong, college, high school. High school pitching, I think, is kind of normal. The weird one, the, the only reason that I still think there's room that maybe there's a draft in the 2020s that will surpass this one is the college pitching is really strange, Josh. Like, you've got Paul Skeens, who you could argue is the best draft pitching prospect of all time. You, you can make that case. And then you've got Rhett Lauder, who's very consistent. I think he's he's like – I'm not knocking his stuff. I think he's more floor than ceiling. I think Rhett Lauder is a very good bet to be a, a, a good, like, number three starter, maybe a two. Like, very consistent Wake Forest. You got Chase Dolan or Tennessee, who was supposed to be the best pitching prospect. And he didn't have in, – in this year's draft. And he didn't have a very good year. He's up and down, inconsistent. Seemed like every start, one bad inning. He didn't make it six innings very often. A lot of teams think he's a quick fix. But after those guys – and then you have Waldrip, who is really interesting, but might be a reliever. He throws a lot of splitters. When you get to the big leagues, your guy's going to be chasing that splitter. He doesn't throw a lot of strikes. He's clear number four. And then after that, I don't think there's another guy who's a lot to go in the first round. So that's kind of the Achilles heel. Like you're going to see um, Skeens is going to go top two picks. Louder and Dolander, even with Dolander's inconsistent year, probably going to go in the top 10, 11 picks. Um, Waldrop's going to go somewhere probably in the teens. And then there might not be a college pitcher taken until the 30s. But it, it is a pretty, it is a pretty strong draft. I mean, like if you're the White Sox, you like you could sit there and dream like, man, it would have been nice to be the Twins and win the lottery, you know, and jump up to number five. I do feel like you're going to get a better player at number fifteen than you would in a normal year. Like, so it's not a bad year to be picking fifteen if that it's feel which feels weird to say, but like, and the hard thing for projecting who they're going to pick is, you know, we have that clear top five, and then I mentioned the two other pitchers who are going to go pretty good, and I think Kyle Teal probably goes ahead of the White Sox. And I think the top high school pitcher, who's Noble Meyer, probably goes ahead of the White Sox. That's like nine guys. And then there's a group of probably, I don't know, a dozen college hitters and probably six or eight high school hitters that could go in any order. Like, I, I think that that might be – it won't go exactly like this, but that's 18 guys. They might be 18 in the next 20 or 22 picks. And it's, But it's very hard, like, what order they're going in, like, almost – any of those guys could be in play or some of them could go eight spots ahead of the White Sox. So you were at the MLB draft combine. I love the concept. Do you think it's doing a better job of helping teams be more informed on certain players for the first round? Or do you think this is helping teams and even those participating in the combine to get noticed for these teams to figure out their options and then the comp round or the second round or later? Yeah, you know, I look at it more, it's not the on-field stuff that matters as much. Because most of these guys have been heavily scouted. Most of your top, say, 50, they had, I don't know what the final count was, but there were, I think, 300-something players who accepted invitations. Some of them weren't the college ones. But we'll use around number 300. Almost everybody ranked in the top 50, doesn't take BP, doesn't throw a bullpen. A lot of the pitchers don't throw. Because if I'm a college pitcher, you've seen me 14, 15, 16 times if I'm a starter. Mm -hmm. If I'm a hitter, you've, you've got 60 games in the books. It's all the videos on Synergy. You've seen me take BP. So the top, top guys have nothing to prove on the field. You know, I think sometimes you have guys coming back from, like, physical questions, like like Cam Johnson, who's a high school lefty, or Hunter Owen, who's a lefty from Vanderbilt. So throwing a bullpen, you're like, oh, hey, Kay, he looks good. You know, arm looks like it's working well. Um, you know, BP, I mean, it was fun. Some guys put on a show. Um, Kemp Alderman, Brandon Winokur, But we, we knew those guys could. There were a lot of guys who hit the ball well. It, it's more... I think – I don't even think it's that, that, that many guys are rising up and down boards, but it's the off-field stuff. It's the interview process, which everybody's loved since year one, is, you know, and, you know yeah, it's only – 20. you meet with guys sometimes outside of the combine too. But, like, you get 20 or 30 minutes with a kid, and he might come in and meet six or eight guys in your front office. And, I mean, I, you know, I, I guess you could, you could hammer him with tough questions if you wanted. But, like, I think it's more – you just get to get a feel for each other. And people love that. And, and like, I do think – it's weird. I, I do think guys move up and down more on the interview process than they do on the on-field stuff. Not wildly, but like, 
if, if a kid seems kind of introverted or a little off sometimes, like that could hurt a kid. And sometimes guys are like, wow, man, like that guy, you know, that high school kid came in, just commanded the room, very comfortable himself. So that matters. And then they made a great change like two years ago. So first year of the combine in 21, they had medical exams. But, you know, I would say Josh Nelson, oh, hey, Josh, you know, well, you could send to a medical exam and you're going to be like, well, what happens if it shows something? It's going to hurt my draft stock. Right. And I'm in the and I'm like, well, Josh, tough. Sorry. Like, and so what are you going to, you're going to be like, well, why am I taking a physical? Like, I'm not doing that. So I don't think a lot of guys took physicals. After the first year, they, were, they needed an incentive to get players to take the physical. And they came up with it. And so now if you go to the combine and you can send to a full medical exam, which almost all the guys do, like I think it's 80 percent it might even be higher you're guaranteed 75 percent of your assigned pick value so if you go to the combine and i say oh man i don't like your shoulder josh it's kind of concern that's fine like but but it's helpful to the player in that let's say there's something that's vague like you're a pitcher we can interpret your arm a bunch of different ways conservative doctor might be like oh man i think josh is gonna blow out yeah and a more you know liberal doctor may say you know what that's normal wear and tear we're fine with that and so you ensure that a you're going to get drafted by a team that isn't concerned rather than, hey, I draft you. And then we do the post-draft physical and we're like, oh, we don't like this. Sorry, Josh, we're not going to sign you. Go to school and everything blows up. This way, teams know what they're getting into. So you're more likely to get drafted by a team that's fine with whatever your physical showed if there was an anomaly or whatever. And B, you're guaranteed 75% of your slot. I can't take you in a million and a half, you know, let's say I was trying to think of a round number, $2 million slot. And I can't offer you like, well, Josh, eh, your shoulder and your knee are kind of screwed up. We're going to give you a million dollars. I can't do that. I have to offer you one five. And so I, I, it's, it's a good incentive. And I think teams for years have wanted to get medical information on players rather than we draft you. Then we do the physical. Yeah. And hey, Kumar Rock, you're sorry. Brady Aiken, sorry. It, it happens to a lot of lesser profile guys too. So that part's good. So that stuff's almost more important. And, it, and so I know this was wound up being a long answer. I don't think it's so much that like Kemp Alderman goes and puts on a show in batting practice. You're like, yeah, you know what? Like I, I personally do like Kemp Alderman. I think he's a little underrated, but what teams know Kemp Alderman, he played all year at Ole Miss. They've seen him for years. Like they knew he had great power. He probably had some of the best exit dealers in the draft, which they knew. It's not like Kemp Alderman crushes the ball 450 feet. And they're like, Hey, we got to take Kemp Alderman in the thirties. I think you kind of know what Kemp Alderman is, but it's the interviews and it's the medical stuff and, and the athletic testing. And I don't think a ton of guys, not as many guys do the medical testing as do the the like the medical exams but if you can get like athletic like guys doing broad jumps and vertical leaps and shuttle runs and and, and force plate things and like that teams like to have that extra data if they can get it so looking at the number one pick the pittsburgh pirates are obviously on the clock on socksmachine.com for our patreon supporters i wrote a column and why I think the Pittsburgh Pirates should take Paul Skeens after watching the College World Series and looking back at the historical number one overall picks for the college starting pitchers. But it, it, this is hard to guess of what Pittsburgh is going to do, Jim, because we've seen the Pirates recently have the number one pick and surprise people by taking Henry Davis number one. And he's already in the major leagues and he's already hit a home run and he's hitting a little bit for the pirates. So I don't think they have any regret, but they signed him at six and a half million dollars. That was the fifth highest signing bonus in that 2021 draft class. So they could go way over slot in the second round at around $2.8 million for a high school pitcher. You have in your latest mock that Dylan Cruz is going number one to the Pittsburgh Pirates. Any chance that the Pirates could surprise again by going under slot at number one? Yeah, I mean, and the thing is, it's, it's, it's two different drafts. So that 2021 draft, you know, I don't think that, there, there weren't guys like that. I think the top five guys in this draft all would have had a good chance to be ranked as the number one prospect back in 2021. So it's a little different. It's not like, the Pirates are doing what they should do. I don't think the Pirates made a decision. I don't think the Pirates – like, it behooves the number one team to let everybody kind of twist in the wind and maybe God brings his price down a little bit, even if it's five minutes before the draft. Like, we found out about Henry Davis, I feel like three or four minutes before the draft began, that they were going to take him number one. And we knew they were shopping the deal. And I still think if Marcelo Meyer or Jordan Lawler would have taken $6.5 million, they probably would have taken those guys over Henry Davis. And, and you're right, Henry Davis, I think he can hit. I don't know if he's a catcher. He's going to be a fine player. 
I, I don't think like, oh, it's like, oh, there's nobody who really jumps out at us. Who do we pay? But I think they could go in a lot of different directions. Like you hear, you hear rumors that Dylan, like the slot is $9.7 million. It's a huge slot. So theoretically, the bonus record is 8.4. So whoever you sign, you're going to save money anyway. And then their bonus pulls over $16 million. So if you go the 5% over, you can go without losing draft picks. That's another 800000 So if you sign a guy for $9.2 million, you're still going to have an extra $1.3 million to play with with your extra picks. Um, and the, so you don't have to cut a deal to have money to spend. The other thing that's tricky is they don't pick again until 42. There are, I think, nine teams that either have their second or in the Mariners' case, their third pick, and a $12, $13 million bonus pool or higher before the Pirates pick. So if you cut mm-hmm. a deal, if you're cutting a deal at one for the sake of cutting a deal, who are you pushing to 42? And is he going to get there? I'm not convinced. Like, I, I could go on and on about stories of teams that cut deals, and we're going to push guys down, and the guy never made it to him. Um, like, you could have you could have multiple can You might have, okay, here's four guys we like. They all could go 29 to 41, and you don't get them. So there's risk. That's like I would never – like even – I guess it would depend. Like if you have a situation where you're the, like the Cubs, for instance, and you love Kyle Schwarber, and you, you want to take him at four, but you know other teams don't have him that high, and you can save money as an offshoot of the guy you love, yes. Did the same thing with Kate Horton last year, who you know I love. The Cubs did the same thing. I, I wouldn't cut a deal – for the sake of cutting a deal to push guys down, because I, I just think you yep. get burned. I think it's and especially a one-one, you got to take the best guy. So that, that said, they're gonna they're gonna still you should do your due diligence and find out what the various guys cost and what you're playing with. I mean that's just part of the game. And also even if even if you knew there was one guy you wanted, you still want to create the the uh, possibility that you're you're looking at other guys maybe knock his price down. So Dylan Cruz. You know, I think most teams would take Dylan Cruz number one. It's it, I'm with you. I would take Paul Skeens. I think he's a, like a once in a decade type of pitcher. He might be the best draft pitching prospect of all time. And you're right. You go back and look at those number one pitchers. Most of them turn out pretty well. And I know Str- it seems Strasburg's contract right now is terrible, <laughs> but you know, and, and he's going to deliver no value on it. He's he's probably done pitching. They won a World Series with Steven Strasburg, and he's one of the best pitchers baseball when he was healthy um so anyway i i'm with you i would take paul Skeens, but i think most teams yep. would rather mitigate the risk and take the top hitter because this top hitter the position players don't cruise now there's rumors he wants 10 million dollars um which is fine maybe true maybe not be true who knows i i don't i'm not like if that's true i'm not convinced that if the pirates don't take him where's he getting 10 like like i don't necessarily think the tigers would go like 1.5 or 1.7 million over slot to get <laughs> Dylan Cruz at number three. So like, even if he wants 10, I, I don't even know where he's getting 10. But even if, let's say that's a hard and fast, Dylan Cruz absolutely won't sign for less than 10, which again, I don't even believe that because he's not going to go back to LSU. But like the Pirates offer him nine or, or say 9.2. So it's a little bit over the national slot. How's he turning that down? And if you sign Dylan Cruz for 9.2, and you'd still have an extra 1.3 million play with in the draft. So I'm not convinced that they're not going to take Dylan Cruz Everybody, I think there, there's this thought like, oh, they cut, like you said, they cut the deal in 21, so they're going to cut a deal again. I, I, I think they can kind of take where they think is the best guy. Same thing with Skeens. If they think Skeens is the best guy, and that's who I would pick, and you don't draft for need, but I actually think they need pitching more than they need position players. I don't think he's like the number, the slot at two is $9 million. Maybe if you take him at one, you pay him $9.1 million. You still have a bunch of money to play with. You know, you've got Wyatt Langford's interest. I, I think Wyatt Langford's kind of the sleeper. Everybody thinks they cut a deal. It's going to be with Max Clark, the Indiana high school outfield, who, as we both the Mike Shirley would love to get Max Clark, not get him. If Mike Lice was Indiana guys, he's mm-hmm. not getting Max Clark. Um, I think he, I think Mike Shirley would take Max Clark. Yep. One I, I honestly do. Um, and he's a very talented player. He probably has better all around tools than anybody in that group. He's probably the guy who's going to take the biggest discount to go one because he might, he's, I, I don't think he goes higher than four or five otherwise. And so you might be able to sign him for eight as the number one pick. And then you'd have, you're using your average two and a half million dollars to play with. Um, but I, I think Langford's a sleeper. I know there's there's some scouts who think Langford, the gap between Cruz and Langford is not as big as, as fans might perceive. Um, he's got more power than Cruz. He's a little less athletic, a little less polished as a hitter. Um, but and I know guys who like Langford more than Cruz. Um, so Langford's a possibility. And if Langford's going to go three, maybe you sign Langford for 8.75. And then Walker Jenkins, he's kind of the fifth guy. 
he's got the same agent as Dylan Cruz. Like, I guess there's a scenario where if Scott Forrest thought Dylan Cruz was going to go two, maybe he would do a deal for Walker Jenkins to go one, and then Cruz goes two. Who, who knows? But I, I think they're all in play, and I don't think we're going to know until right before the draft. I don't think they're necessarily looking to cut a deal for deal's sake. I think they're just doing their due diligence. Like, let's figure out what we think we're going to have to pay each of these guys, and if they, we'll line them up how we like them and, and take a look. And But, like, I don't think – like, like, I think the most you're going to save if you took Max Clark, who would probably be the least expensive of them, versus Dylan Cruz, who'd probably be the most expensive, you're saving like $1.2 million, um, which isn't nothing. But again, I don't know who you're pushing to 42. So if you think Max Clark yeah. and Dylan Cruz are the same, okay, Max Clark would make some sense. If you think Dylan Cruz is better than Max Clark, you should take Dylan Cruz. More with Jim Callis as we talk about the strategies the Chicago White Sox could take in the first round next after a quick word from our sponsors. I'm sure many of you had this debate with significant others and friends about how fashionable cargo shorts are. As someone who has fought these battles and has been willing to die on the hill about the benefits of cargo shorts, I found a new light. In my attempts to get into more shape, I've lost a couple of pants short sizes, so it was time for a new wardrobe fix, and I discovered an apparel company called Bird Dogs. They make a wide range of gear, but they get high marks for their shorts. After receiving a pair, I understand the hype. Bird Dogs stretch khaki shorts have a slimmer fit, so it's more in line with today's fashion trends. It gives legs a sculpted look, but it's still a great fit around the waist, so I don't feel constricted. That's because bird dog shorts are not made with stiff, restricted cotton. Bird dogs invented a cloud knit fabric that looks just like khaki, but it stretches to get you a way slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement, which is key for me. I want to look fashionable, but in a practical way. It's going to get hot in Chicago. I promise you. And if you are like me, wanting to up your shorts game, Check out Bird Dogs. Right now, they're running a special. When you make your order at birddogs.com, use promo code POOL at checkout to receive a free Yeti-style tumbler. Again, the URL is birddogs.com slash POOL. Use promo code POOL at checkout for that gift. So the White Sox have the 15th pick, and I've struggled in previous mocks trying to figure out two things. We talked about one the first part right away, who I want the White Sox to take, and try to guess who the White Sox are actually going to take. In our last mock on SoxMachine.com two weeks ago, I had the White Sox taking Ole Miss shortstop Jacob Gonzalez because I thought he was the best player available on the board. Shocker, in your latest (laughs) mock draft, you have Jacob Gonzalez going to the White Sox at pick 15. So what was your thinking, Jim, of assigning Gonzalez to the White Sox 15th overall? Well, the White Sox pick is extremely difficult to project. Because one we talked about, you don't know who's going to get there. And there's all these rumors that, that, like, the Twins at five. Like, you would think that would be the easy pick. You got your five guys who are potential number one in overall picks in any draft. You just take who's left. But there's also thought, like, hey, the, the Twins are a heavy model team. And their model's going to want a college bat. So maybe if it's Max Clark or Walker Jenkins, they might take Jacob. I've heard Jacob Gonzalez as high as five. Um A's, who knows what they're doing, and then it gets murky. You know, the Royals could cut a deal. The Royals could take, you know, they, they've done that in the past. The Royals could just take the best guy on the board. Where are these pitchers going? So it's all extremely murky. But so that's one. And then two, like you hear <laughs> differing reports. Like I hear the White Sox on a lot of high school bats, a lot of high school bats. When I get other teams who are like pick them behind or like, I just don't see. With the way the big league club's going right now, and you look at their farm system, how they could take a high school kid. They need to get guys who are going to move quicker and get some college guys to move. And again, you shouldn't draft because of demographic. But again, who are they looking at 15? It's not, I doubt there's going to be one guy who's head and shoulders above the rest. So if it's, if you have like a group of guys who are close, they very well might favor a college guy. So I, I, I'm torn on that. I've gone back and forth high school, college, college, high school, whatever. Um, I just thought of the guys I had on board. I, I had high school guy, high school hitters going 12, 13, 14. So that kind of thinned out the high school hitting group a little bit. You know, I, I, I had Colin Halk, who's a Georgia shortstop, Arjun Namala, who's a, who's a Florida shortstop, A. Miller, who's Florida third baseman, going 12, 13, 14. And 
I think those guys would be in the White Sox mix if they got to 15. So they were off. So I had more college guys than high school guys I thought they'd be looking at. I had Blake Mitchell, who I actually projected going eighth. He's a high school catcher. And I actually think he's safer than your typical high school catcher because if he wasn't a catcher, he'd still be a potential first-round pick. The bat's that good. He's not a, oh, he's a catcher, but I don't know if he's going to hit type of guy, um, like a Jeff Mathis or, or Drew Romo or somebody like that. Uh, but I had him gone too. So the only high school guy I really had that was on the board for them was a kid named Walker Martin, and they would be kind of the ceiling for Walker Martin. He, he's this interesting Colorado, you know, I think he plays quarterback. You know, he's interesting. So I had all these – so I had all these high school guys. I had four high school guys going off the board before him. So I went Gonzalez. But, I mean, I could have gone Jacob Wells in the Grand Canyon. I still wonder if if Matt Shaw from Maryland and Tommy Troy, who are two more shots, uh, shortstops, I feel like they're kind of moving up. And they might go ahead of Gonzalez. You got Nolan Chanuel, who had the best numbers of anybody in college baseball as a first baseman for Florida Atlantic. You have Enrique Bradfield, who's a speedy guy from Vanderbilt, whose stock's dipping a little bit. You have Johanny Morales at Miami, who they loved in high school. You have Chase Davis at Arizona. Like, I know I just rattled off like, what, nine college names? Bring Taylor from TCU, I could see being in their mix. I have him going six, but if he doesn't go six, he might get to 15. So I just. I took Jacob Gonzalez, but honestly, if I and I did that draft mock draft Thursday night. So as we record this, it's two days later. If I was doing the draft, if I was doing another mock draft today, I might come to an entirely different conclusion. Because it's it's just as you know, when you're doing a mock draft and you're trying to figure out the 15th pick, it's all dependent on who you have going ahead of him. But I just he, he's J- Jacob Gonzalez is really interesting. He's played well for three years at Ole Miss, won a College World Series championship last year. He was the collegiate national team starting shortstop for two years. But it's I, – I feel like he's – I think he's slipping a little bit in the draft. I, I think Sean Troy might be moving ahead of him and Taylor moving ahead of him because some guys get 30 run times on him, as, you know, and some guys get you know, might, might be a little kinder and go 40 run times, but he's not that quick, athletic – Shortstop. A lot of guys don't think he's a shortstop. So then if he's a third baseman, there's more pressure on the bat. You know, I will say in his defense, I mean, he came into the year, I think we had him ranked as the fifth best prospect in the draft. And I think he's been under the microscope a lot. And those guys tend to get nitpicked a lot um, when you've been a top guy for, for so long. But like he's, there's some teams that struggle a little bit with good player, but you know, how exactly is that profile going to look when he's in the big leagues? We did get this question from one of our Patreon supporters, Doug Wirtz, and we talked about the Pirates trying to go under slot. And Doug was wondering, could the White Sox go under slot in the first round to increase their opportunity of maybe getting a better prospect in the second or third rounds? I mean, they could. I, I don't think they will for a couple of reasons. One, they don't have that large of a pool to begin with. So let's say, like, there's their slot's about $4.5 million. Most of the guys that are going to get, they're, they're going to be picking from this pool. You know, I, I don't know. I, I know I've been very long winded. I probably rattle off like 15 names of guys who could be in their mix, not counting the guys who will definitely be off the board. And yeah, well, some of those guys are going to fall to the late 20s, but they're going to be all in the mix for all these teams. So I don't think like anybody they're going to be looking at that you're going to be able to like maybe you could sign a guy for four million dollars instead of four point five. But, you know, and then, then they can go. They have, like, roughly an extra 450 because their pool's $9 million. Like, that could push your, your number two pick up to, like, you know, $2.5 million or so. But, like I was talking about with the Pirates, there's all these teams that have these huge bonus pools ahead of them that I don't know who you're pushing down to 50. Anybody you're pushing down to 51 for, say, $2.5 million, or even let's say they, they, they go real discount for $3 million, there's going to be, A, everybody in the back half of the first round has, like, essentially $3 million slot. The Astros had the last first round at 28, and that's 2.9. And then you have all these teams in the comp round that have a bunch of extra money in large pools. And, three. like, I just think it's good. I, I think the answer is no, because I think it would be even harder for the White Sox to push a guy down. Like, if you I, – I don't know who it would be. Like, some guy – like, we'll just randomly choose Dylan Head, who's a Chicago area – you know, high school product, fast player. Like, and I think he probably goes in the first round. But let's say, for a reason, Dylan Head's going to slide 
into the sandwich round and he's looking at two and a half million dollars and the White Sox sense this and they're like, Dylan, we'll give you three. Like, still doesn't mean somebody else might not take Dylan head and maybe they won't even match the three million, but they're like, Dylan, we'll give you two and a half. So you're really not going to school over $500,000 at that point? Probably not. So I, I just think, I wouldn't say it's impossible, but I think it'd be very difficult for the White Sox to push a guy down to the second round. Another Patreon question we got comes from Kennedy. If you had to choose which demographic or individual player can we as White Sox fans basically rule out as a potential first rounder for the White Sox, they just want to know who they could ignore this upcoming week uh, with the draft reports and the player profiles. But is there anyone or any demographic that you can somewhat definitively say, I don't think the White Sox are to go in this direction at pick 15? Yeah, I I don't think they are ruling out any demographic, which is good. You should never do that. There aren't enough good players in drafts to say, oh, we're not going to take high school hitters. Um, I don't think they're going to get a college pitcher because, I, like I said, I think the three guys who would be obvious picks for them are not going to get to 15, and I don't think they're going to take Walter. So I, I, I'd be shocked if they took a college pitcher. High school pitcher, I won't say no, but I, I think it's unlikely. I think the best high school pitcher is Noble Meyer. It's always hard projecting where, where high school pitchers are going to go. I think he's going to go ahead of them. Um, they might be tempted by him if he got to him. The next best is Tommy White, who's a lefty. I don't think they've necessarily ruled him out, like, but I just I don't see it. So I, I think they're going to wind up with a position player more because that's just the way this draft is set up and the way the picks are going to unfold as opposed to they want a hitter or they're anti-pitcher. I, I think they would love. I, I'll put. The, if, I think if Rhett Lauder or Chase Dolaner got to 15, which I don't think there's any way it happens, I think they would pick those guys in a second, but they're not, and I don't think they're going to take Waldrop at 15. More with Jim Callis as we answer some questions from our Patreon supporters next after a quick word from our sponsors. One reason why I hate buying tickets to anything these days is the waiting room you know that feeling you get the pre-sale code and even if you got the pre-sale code and you log in you're stuck in the waiting room with thousands of other people not even sure if you're going to get a chance to buy tickets buying tickets to any event shouldn't be stressful and that's why i've switched and used game time it's the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports music comedy and theater shows near you i use it to buy concert and theater tickets now for chicago events you could use it it's also great for major league baseball games as well they have some killer deals especially when it comes to white Sox tickets as game time is the place for last minute ticket deals forget planning months in advance Game Time has deals on tickets right up to the day of the event, and you can get exclusive flash deals on tickets for the baseball games or any of the comedy and theater shows that'll be happening all summer long in Chicago. And what I really like about Game Time is that they have the Game Time guarantee, which means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. That's why it's one of the fastest growing ticketing apps in the country for a reason. So snag the tickets without stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app on your phone, either for Apple or Android devices. Create an account and use promo code SOXMACHINE for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account on Game Time and redeem code SOXMACHINE for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. So this question from Ed on that topic about pitching, uh, he wrote to us, Hey, Jim and Josh, regarding Jim's most recent mock, he stated the White Sox are desperate for pitching, and you guys always talk about on the podcast the White Sox need more pitching depth. Is there anyone in the second round in pick 51 and beyond, any group of pitchers that you like going to the White Sox? Yeah, let me – I'm going to pop up our draft list. See, I think it makes – you're more likely to do something there – than to push a guy up higher than he should go. Now, one, you never know with high school pitchers. Sometimes those guys fall. Um, and and the White Sox are going through this with Matthew Thompson, Andrew Dahlquist, Jared Kelly. Yeah, I mean that that track record is a little scary. But like you know maybe Blake. I, and again, I don't know if Blake Walters is another Illinois kid who would get down there. You know, but like he'd be interesting if he did. Um, you know, I think if you're looking for college pitchers, you could be looking at guys like. 
he probably goes a little higher than this because of the shortage of pitching. But Brandon Sprode from Florida has got a very good arm. He'd be interesting. Um, Hunter Owen from Vanderbilt, who I mentioned, is a combine guy. He missed for the last eight weeks of the season. But you look at the combine. If teams think he's healthy, he might not get to him. Um, Ty Floyd from LSU, who was great in the College World Series, struck out 17 to tie the nine-inning record. Um, at the College World Series, a record for nine-inning game. Um, he may move up ahead of that now because of the shortage of pitching. You got Kate Keeler at Campbell, um, who's got a live arm. You got Warren Watts Brown, Oklahoma State, who's got a live arm. Um, they aren't afraid to take high school guys, so high school guy could factor in. But yeah, those, those are some names of, of some pitchers who could be in that area. Um, you know, there's high school Alex Clemmy's a high school kid, Paul Wilson's a high school kid. Um, probably forgetting some high school kids. But um, but there will be opportunities to take arms who belong in that area. Yeah. Blake Walters is the the one podcast listeners that I have heard that the White Sox have some interest in, but I agree with Jim. There's murmurs that he may not be on the board when the White Sox pick at 51. And he might cost you two and a half, three. He'd right. be an over slot guy if he got to 51. So, again, you'd have to move some money around. Uh, moving away from the draft real quick, we did get this one question from our – our friend overseas in England, Colin, and uh, Colin's question's a bit cheeky. He wrote, there is a rumor going around that the White Sox rebuild has failed, partly due to an inability to develop players. Any idea in what the White Sox are doing wrong on the farm? And yeah, things are not going well in the south side of Chicago, Jim. And we have talked about this for years, and you lived through the rebuild with us watching all the White Sox make these trades and the high draft picks and hoping that they would have a similar contention window like the Chicago Cubs have had. And it really came crashing uh, ever since the 2022 season. What are your thoughts of like what has happened with the White Sox? And are there any easy shortfalls that you could point to say, well, this is where the hiccups were in their development? Yeah, I don't, I don't think, I mean, I, I think it was an easy solution. The White Sox would already have solved it, if that makes sense. Like, so I, yeah. I will say, and I'm not trying to, like, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying this as a criticism of, like, say, the scouting department. But to me, I do think talent's talent. Like, I, I don't feel like in retrospect, like, like you mentioned, the high school pitchers. That, that's been something they've struggled to develop. They put a lot of money into Matthew Thompson, Andrew Dahlquist, and Jerry Kelly, and you know, is it that, boy, development screwed these guys up? Or is it that maybe they weren't as good as the White Sox thought they were? I mean, Jared Kelly's conditioning his first year was not very good. Um, you know, I, I I think I told you. I mean, I didn't – I'll put – I don't think – I wasn't like, oh, my God, these are awful picks. I did not like Matthew Thompson and Andrew Dahlquist as much as the White Sox did in, in the draft. Um, so – you know, again, now it sounds like I'm killing the scout department <laughs> and I'm not trying to. But, you know, and again, I mean, these are collective decisions made. But, like, I don't feel like like Jared Kelly was a can't miss. I mean, Jared Kelly came in, like, really overweight. So, like, it wasn't like development made him eat too much or not get in condition. I mean, I think he's in a lot better shape now. Um, so I think it's more. And again, I, I feel bad because I feel like I'm, I'm pointing fingers at the scouting department. I don't think it's that they've ruined a bunch of guys who were can't miss prospects. I think that some of these guys weren't as good as the White Sox thought they were. I mean, I, we talked about Yawkey Suspedis, who we had – I don't do our international list. He was number one on our international list. I talked to a lot of people who were like, I'm not sure if Yawkey Suspedis is going to hit. Um, and, you know, the White Sox, you know, put a bunch of money in Yawkey Suspedis. I don't think – I don't think the White Sox did something to Yoelki Suspedes. I think that a lot of the other teams I talked to were right. He chases a lot of pitches, and they were worried about it, and he still chases a lot of pitches. And it's not like that's an easy fix where you're just like, Yoelki, stop chasing pitches. Like, right. you know, I think some of these guys, like with any player you take, there, there's upside and there's concerns. Like there's very few, hey, this guy's flawless, like, Hey, Paul Skeens, like roll him out there and he's good to big leagues. And I just think with some of the guys who haven't developed, I think it's more a case of what you knew were their weaknesses 
they weren't able to get better. And, and I don't think that's necessarily a indictment that they were developing these guys the wrong way. Um, yeah, I, so I don't know. Now I, now I feel bad. I feel like I just crushed the scouting department. But, uh, <laughs> um, I wasn't trying to do that. But like, I don't think, I don't think it's like, oh, they don't know pitch shapes, or oh, their hitting instructors aren't teaching guys the right way. Like, like every individual player is different. And I just think, I mean, I will say, uh, I'm probably I, I, again, I'm not trying to indict anybody. If you look at like when the White Sox farm system ranked really, really well. A lot of their best prospects came over in trades. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, look, they made some great draft picks too. I mean, Chris Sale. I mean, I know it's going back a little ways, but like Chris Sale, I mean, that was a great draft pick. And, you know, they've had, you know, Tim Anderson, that was a great draft pick. They've made a lot of good draft picks too. But like, I don't think it's that they had all these guys and and now you're like going, well, geez, like those guys were all can't miss and they've missed. Uh, I, what do you think? Is that fair? I, I, I do think that is fair. I also think that there's got to be some type of disconnect because when we see prospects hitting really well in Birmingham or in Charlotte, for whatever reason in recent years, it's not carrying over to Chicago. Yeah. And I'm just I, – I'm wondering, like, the preparation. That was something that the White Sox mentioned going into the season that they're trying to improve upon. But not everybody has bought into the eye pitch machine and the new game preparation that Pedro Grafal and his staff are, are trying to implement. It, it's been a, a slow buying process for some of the players uh, on the roster. I, I also think that there's there's too many players on this team that are swing happy, if that makes sense. Yeah, like, well, uh, Plate patience, plate discipline has been over. Yeah, and I think... At the big league, like I will say with the Charlotte factor, Charlotte is like a launching pad. So I think, right, you got to take everybody's numbers there with a grain of salt. Everybody hits a Charlotte, everybody hits <clears throat> for power. But yeah, I mean, if you look at, you know, guys like, I mean, Mankata, who got to the big leagues at a young age, Mankata was always swing happy. Like, and I don't think that's the White Sox fault. Like, that's hard to change. Luis Robert. Very good player. I mean, he's having a great year. But Luis Roberts very swing happy. Yep. I don't think you're going to get that to change. You know, Eloy, fairly swing happy. Like, like, and again, I mean, all those guys were great prospects. You know, Robert was the guy they signed. I mean, there was good scouting there. They invested heavily in him. Our two guys they traded for. Yeah, the one who surprises me, but I don't feel like it's like the White Sox ruined him. Andrew Vaughn was, like, known to be this, like, really disciplined hitter. And even he, like, he's walking less than 10% of the time and, and striking out a little bit more than I, than I might have thought. So I don't think, again, I don't even feel like it's like, hey, swing more. Like, it's just sometimes, like, play discipline is the hardest thing. Like, the, the swing happiness, it's hard to break guys in that. And I don't have a good reason for why Andrew Vaughn is more swing happy than I thought he would have been. And Eloy, I mean, Eloy was never, I don't think, going to walk 100 times, but Eloy is more swing happy. I don't know why these guys got more swing happy than the big league level. I, you know, it's, 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 I, I've always had a soft spot for Jake Berger and I, I love the Missouri State guys. And he's got 17 homers, which is great, but he's striking out seven times as much as he, as he walks. And he wasn't that swing happy. Yeah. So I don't know. Again, I don't even think that's like, there's not like there's this swing happy virus that's infecting guys when they get to Chicago. But like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't know what what what's going on there. But like, it, it's it's you're right. I mean, it's it is a very. I think they're last in the American League in walks, right? Yeah, last in walks, last in on base percentage. Luis Robert hit 11 home runs in June, had 16 RBIs. Andrew Bennett said he's got over a 400 on base percentage, but he only scored I think like 10 runs <laughs> in the month of June. It's there's a there's a disconnect here and. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it reminds a lot of fans of 2015 White Sox. You have a couple of good offensive players, and then a lot of well below average offensive players, and things are just not clicking right now, offensively for the White Sox. I don't know how you fix it because again, it's not even at the development level. It's not a matter of just telling guys, you know, like everybody was convinced during the Moneyball era. Oh, the A's are going to teach all these. Like you can't. I don't think you can teach play, teach play discipline. You can emphasize it. But, like, it's hard. I think even by the time you get into pro ball for so many of these guys, your swing decisions are kind of embedded in your mind at that point because you've been playing baseball right. for so long. It's not like, you know, you get to pro ball and, and anybody's – like, I don't know. I can't name a single organization 
that people look at and go, oh, they teach great plate discipline. Like you may be able to help a guy with his swing and some guys make, um, like I think, um, I don't know how long it's going to last, but Michael Talkman with the Cubs, I was reading an article recently where he was saying the reason he thinks he's having success is he's making a concentrated effort to improve his swing decisions. Like they, like, which again, I mean, that makes sense, but it's harder said than done. And he's really focused on not even trying to go a couple inches outside the zone. And so, but that almost is like he had this epiphany hey, my career's on the line. I'm going to hyper focus. And it's hard. Like, and I don't think a lot, of, like, you know, and, and yeah, I don't know what his vision is compared to somebody else's vision. But yeah, it's, it's tough. But like, I don't, I don't think there's anything systemic that the White Sox are doing wrong or, I think they've gotten a lot more modern than they were, say, five, ten years ago in their development. Like, I think they've caught up to where base, you know, most teams are, as opposed to maybe being technologically or um, analytically behind some other clubs. I, I feel like they've 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 closed that gap and they've gotten a lot better in those regards. I think ultimately, the biggest factor with developing talent is the talent part and not the developing part. But even that doesn't explain why. Everybody on the big league club. I mean, I'm looking here. Does any? I don't even think anybody has a 10% walk rate on the big league club in the starting lineup. Like, no. Like Gavin Sheets is the closest. He's at like 9.9%. I guess it would might round to 10. I'm doing the math in my head, but like, uh, like that. And that I, I would say is more like I would put that on the front office. Is that like that's the type of team you've assembled? Assembled, and it's also a very, as you know, right-handed heavy. Lineup. I mean, they get they have them kind of in grand dollar switch hitters, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't think you can blame any one aspect for the fact that their window seems to have closed more quickly than we thought. Well, before we let you go, can you give me one player that could be taken earlier than expected Sunday night in the Major League Baseball draft? How early are we talking? Uh, it could even be like somebody that might be ranked forty to 50th on your guys' top 250 list that goes in the top 28. Yeah, you know, the guy who jumps to mind, we talked to him out a little bit, is Nolan Shanuel. You know, he had crazy year. I mean, <laughs> for what we just talked about, that's who you should want for the White Sox, Josh, because, I mean, Florida Atlantic, he had 444 on base percentage of 612, slug yeah. 864, 71 walks, 14 strikeouts. So there you go. And I do think, like, I mean, the teams that, that are performance heavy and model heavy, it's kind of hard to top those numbers. I mean, he's a first baseman who might be able to play the outfield, so it's not like he's an up-the-middle guy. But I do think, like, his name seems to be climbing, climbing, climbing. I think he could go as high as 11th to the Angels. Wow. And I, and I, haven't, I haven't heard this, but if you told me that somebody cut a deal in the top 10 with him, like, a model team that just loves those numbers. The way I keep hearing his name going up and up, it wouldn't surprise me. So I think he might be. He, he I mean, I have him going. Where did I have him? Go? I think I had him going twenty-one the Cardinals, but I think he might go, go higher than that. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. Ty Pete, I, like if you're looking for the guy who's ranked the lowest, who I think could go in the first round or the sandwich round. It might be Ty Pete, who's a high school shortstop from Georgia. There, there are a lot of high school shortstops this year. Um, he's got, you know, as probably as much bat speed as any high school player in the draft. Um, and it seems like he's got some helium right now, too. And, like, right now I had him going to the Rays in the sandwich round. But that could be a case where I do think there's growing interest in him. And these teams with the sandwich round picks might be like, ah, we kind of have to take him in the first round because he's not going get to the, get to get to 29-30 and, and on. So – He'd be the the deeper sleeper who could maybe go the highest. Well, please follow Jim on Twitter, everyone, at Jim Callis MLB. There's going to be a lot of updates between now and draft day. He and Jonathan Mayo are the best at what they do, so continue reading their work on MLB.com and check out their podcast. And, of course, watch Jim on MLB Network Sunday night, starting at 6 p.m. Central Time. So, Jim, enjoy Seattle. I know that you love draft day, and uh, it, it's – it's building up to be a very exciting draft day, and I think more people than expected are going to watch on Sunday in the first round. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, it's, you know, there's some really interesting guys, and then I think you know it's, it's a deep draft, but there's uncertainty. 
so we'll 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 see uh we'll see what happens but yeah no i I am looking forward to it and and seeing where these guys uh wind up going like i said i don't think we're gonna pittsburgh's taken till maybe five minutes before the draft and then we'll have to see where the picks flow from there and that will do it for this episode of the Sox Machine Podcast, previewing the 2023 Major League Baseball Draft. We'll obviously recap all the activity the White Sox make in the Major League Baseball Draft at a future episode of the Sox Machine Podcast as we will be arriving at the All-Star break very shortly. Again, that will be on Tuesday, July 11th, is the All-Star game in Seattle. And then, of course, the White Sox have Wednesday and Thursday off before they get ready to start the post-All-Star break with a road trip to Atlanta. But that will do it for this episode of the Sox Machine Podcast. If you just discovered the Sox Machine Podcast, you can subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts, such as Spotify and Apple Music. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Sox Machine. You can follow me at Sox Machine underscore Josh. We always upload our podcast into our YouTube channel as well, which you can watch those videos at youtube.com slash Sox Machine. If you do so, please hit subscribe to the channel to get future notifications of our new videos. If you enjoy our work and want more, you can get more by signing up at patreon.com slash socksmachine, where our Patreon supporters get exclusive content, ad-free versions of both the podcast and the website, and when we have new Socks Machine swag, they're the first ones to receive it from the store. Monthly plans start at $2, or you can save with an annual subscription. Again, sign up at patreon.com slash socksmachine. The Sox Machine Podcast is a production of SoxMachine.com. You're on for all things Chicago White Sox baseball and part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network. I'm Josh Nelson. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.